coach and area director and past club president for Toastmasters, an international organization dedicated to public speaking and leadership. <clears throat> he wants to share a few of these little changes to help you improve your next speech or presentation. He loves speaking and presenting. He loves Star Trek. <laughs> and he loves helping people to be the best speakers they can be. Please join me in welcoming Gary Bisega. I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a country where they will be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. We all want to know where that's from, right? Martin Luther King's speech. You know, that was almost 50 years ago, actually it was over 50 years ago that speech was given. There's still so much work to be done today. But for me, whenever I hear that speech, and I think for millions of others, it's made a difference in our lives. It's inspired us, it certainly has inspired me to go out and make changes in my world to try and improve things, to try to make things better for people. Dr. King was a leader, and the kind of leader that I would want to follow. If you think about it, have you ever known a leader who wasn't also a great communicator? <coughs> think about the best leaders that you know. Go ahead and shout out. Who would, you, who would you say are some of the best leaders that you've ever known or ever heard of? Anybody? Dr. King, certainly one. Winston Churchill. Winston Churchill, Abraham Lincoln. Maybe Mahatma Gandhi, Indira Gandhi, Kennedy. Kennedy, exactly. All these people, they had one thing in common. They all had a vision. They also knew how to communicate that vision to other people in a way that would make it stick. And so they were able to change their worlds. Well, today we're going to talk about <coughs> two tools that will help you to communicate your message to people better. We're also going to have a Q&A session near the end, and so if you have a piece of paper or something, I would encourage you to go ahead and write down a question, or Leanne told me that y'all really don't need a lot of encouragement to, <laughs> to be interactive, which I think is awesome. But please, please feel free, uh, ask me any questions, uh, I'd be glad to try to answer them, because I know I'm not going to cover everything. But I can promise if you take these two tools that you're going to get today, your very next speech will be much better, and you'll be able to reach your audiences and change your world. Anybody want to change the world? Yeah, I think so. That's why we're all here, right? Well, let's get started. Would you like to learn one tool that will instantly improve the next speech that you give? Not hyperbole, it's real. And this is the thing is, this is a tool that so many speakers either ignore or they don't even know. Well, have you ever been to Las Vegas? Raise your hand if you've been to Las Vegas. A lot of us. I do not want to know what you were doing in Las Vegas. <laughs> but in Las Vegas, you probably know that some of the best performers in the world are there, right? You see them down the strip. You all may also know that the performers are always working on new material, but they also have their old standbys, those songs or jokes that they know are going to just rock their audience and really bring the house down. Well, you may not know something. I didn't know this until pretty recently. But pretty much every performer in Las Vegas will carefully plan out the set that they're doing. And they will usually use their second best song or joke as the first one. But they'll use the best song or joke as the last one. That first song or joke really draws the audience in. It hooks them. That last one, it books them. It stores away the experience in their memory. And it's not only in Las Vegas. Think about the last concert that you went to. We've all been to concerts, I think. I bet you that the performers there did the exact same thing. Performers all over know to do this. They hook them and they book them. Hook them with that first one. You hear that song, and you're like, oh man, I love this song. This is awesome. Then they book them with the last one. You walk out of there 
humming that song in your head. Anybody ever done that? Yes. <laughs> yes, all the time. Or, you th or that joke, you're repeating it to yourself and you're just chuckling about it. If anybody asks you, so what songs did they do? I bet those would be the first two that you think of. If you think about it today, what were my first words when I stood up? I have a dream. I have a dream. I have a dream. Exactly. Now, what if I had stood up first and said, good morning, I'm pleased to be with you today. Boring! Instead of hook em and book em, what do most speakers do? Well, I can tell you what I used to do. I did this for a long time. I would carefully prepare my speech or presentation. I would lay out my introduction and my body with the three carefully listed sub-bullet items like we're supposed to, and then the conclusion. <clears throat> but what were the very first words that I said when I got up on stage? Good morning, I'm happy to be here. But we're not happy. <laughs> not with a beginning like that. Or maybe, before I start, let me give you some background. What do you mean before you start? You've already started. I had no idea what I was going to say, in fact. I figured, ah, I'll just wing it. But do you think that winging it is going to draw people in and make them want to hear more? Absolutely not. I don't think so. Well, one day I was talking to my speaking mentor. And by the way, yes, I do have a public speaking mentor. I would recommend that we all get mentors for public speaking or music or sports or whatever we're interested in. But my public speaking mentor, a gentleman named Craig Valentine, who is a world champion, a former world champion of public speaking, Craig said, Gary, what you need to do is you need to pay attention to the first seven seconds and the last 30 seconds. In fact, you need to know exactly what you're going to say, the exact words for your first seven seconds and your last 30 seconds. That first seven seconds, it hooks us. It draws us in. The last 30 seconds, it books us, stores it away in our memories. We'll walk out of there remembering what the speaker said, and maybe even acting on it. Now, I said before it was a bad idea to start out by saying, before I start, let me give you some background. Or maybe walking up there and, I've said this before, walking up there and said, now, I need to apologize for something. The monitor was supposed to work, or I was supposed to have something here, but we didn't have it here. Sometimes people need background like that, though, to understand what's going on. And so what happens if you actually do need to do something like that? Well, I have two suggestions. My first suggestion is to go ahead and give the background, but don't give it at the beginning. Start out with something that's going to hook them, something that's going to get them interested. And then you can give the background. Then you can say, well, now let me give you some background before we move on. That way they'll get the information and they might actually be listening. So that's the first one. The second suggestion is have your introducer give the background. So many speakers really don't make use of the person who's introducing them. Leanne, introduce me today. Did she just come on up here and step up and say, all right, give it up for Gary Visega. Yeah. No, she didn't. She gave some background. She gave you a little bit of, the, of what we're going to talk about today. And she gave you my credentials. I didn't do that to impress you, by the way. I did that so that we could start right up with, I have a dream. So that's the first tool, hook them and book them. I promise if you use this tool, it will make your speeches literally 100% better. So once we know that we need to hook them and book them, how do we actually get good enough to give your speech as a presentation? Does anybody here play a musical instrument? A few musical instruments? Musical instruments? What instrument do you play? Uh, guitar. Guitar, right? Does anybody play a real instrument? <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally kidding. I play guitar a lot, so it's, it's, guitar is a great instrument. No one plays it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you play it better than I do. 
Does anybody play the piano? Okay, yeah. Well, you know, I'm working right now on a piano piece that has a part that's really, really hard. At least for me, it's hard. For you, it's probably not. But for me, it's really, really hard. We've all had, I think, parts like that in a piece of music. So what do we do when that happens? We practice it. And we practice it, and we practice it, and we practice it over and over and over again. My family is really glad, I think, that my piano has a little quiet lever on it. <laughs> but we know that we need to practice it to get good at it. There's the old joke that I'm sure everybody here knows, the famous violinist walking down the street in New York, and a <clears throat> tourist runs up and says, how do I get to Carnegie Hall? He says, practice, my son, practice. <clears throat> we all know that, right? But it's real life. Performers at Carnegie Hall know that they need to rehearse at home in order to get the reward of performing at Carnegie Hall. And I believe that for us as speakers and presenters, that advice applies as well. We need to rehearse at home to get the reward of performing the presentation. And performing the presentation really is the, is the reward. I believe if we want to go to the, so to speak, Carnegie Hall of speaking, we need to rehearse to get the reward. But what did I do? As usual, for every piece of advice I have, I can give that because I've done the exact opposite. And for me, one day, early in my public speaking, I was preparing a speech. It was for my very first speech contest. Uh, in Toastmasters, we have these speech contests. And Jill does very well in speech contests. And it was my very first speech contest. So I was preparing a speech. And one of the guys in our club named Kim, he made an offhand remark to me. He said, you know, Gary, you don't want to rehearse it too much. If you do, you'll sound unnatural. Well. I took Kim's offhand remark and I turned it into my philosophy of life. I said, yeah, I don't want to sound unnatural. I tell you, what I'll do is I'll just put off rehearsing as long as possible. I'm sure it'll be better that way. After all, you don't want to over rehearse. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what do I do? What do I do? I followed Kim's advice exactly. One day, I was listening to a podcast on public speaking. Yes, there actually are podcasts on public speaking, and I do listen to them. I'm such a geek. Anyway, in this podcast, there was a former actor turned speech coach named Michael Port. I don't know if you've ever heard of Michael Port. But he was an actor, he's a speech coach now, like I said. And he gave some advice in this podcast that absolutely changed my world as far as speaking is concerned. He said, think about the actors. Now, actors will spend weeks at home rehearsing the part so that they can learn it. And then they'll go be with the rest of the cast, and they'll spend weeks and weeks more rehearsing it, eight hours a day. They do all that rehearsing so that they can sound natural. And then he said, do you think the actors are concerned about over-rehearsing? I thought, wow, that really hit me. I think we ought to learn from the actors. My friend Kim, you know, great guy, but I think I'm going to listen to the actors. I think we need to do what they do, rehearse to get the reward. So what do I do now? Well, I still write out my speech. I still write out every word. Well, actually, I type it in. But as soon as the speech gets to a halfway decent state, I start rehearsing it out loud. Yes, out loud. I go down to my speech rehearsal room. Okay, it's actually a TV room. But I pretend that there's people sitting in the chairs. I am such a geek. One time I even went and printed out pictures of people's faces <laughs> and put them on the chairs so I could pretend I was actually talking to people. But I go down there and I start rehearsing it out loud. And 
I would be lying if I said this was an easy process. The first few times you read that speech out loud, it's <clears throat> painful. And it takes forever because you're listening to yourself and you're like, oh, that's terrible. And you're constantly making changes. I tell you, I have been amazed at how things that looked perfectly wonderful when they were written on paper sounded totally ridiculous when I said them out loud. <laughs> Got some, I'm seeing some nods, absolutely. And I got an example from this very speech. In fact, it was that very last line that I just said. When I first wrote, wrote that line, I said, I have been amazed at how things that looked perfectly wonderful on paper sounded ridiculously stilted when I said them out loud. There's a difference, two words. Totally ridiculous, ridiculously stilted. The first time I read that line out loud, I thought, oh yeah, I talk like that all the time. I'm always <laughs> using expressions like ridiculously stilted. So I changed it. And by the way, that's another tool that we really don't have time to talk about a lot today, although I'd be glad to talk about it in the Q&A later. And that is, speak like you talk, not like you write. But the only way you're going to know that is if you actually rehearse it out loud. Now, I think I'm going to follow Michael Port, the actor's advice. I'm going to rehearse to get the reward. I think our audiences are going to thank us. So there you have it, the two little tools. Hook them and book them. Know what you're going to say for the first 30 seconds, the first seven seconds, and the last 30 seconds. And rehearse for the reward. Don't put off rehearsal to the last minute, but make it part of your speech writing process. Now somebody might be thinking, that's it? That's all there is to public speaking? I think every one of us would say no. Honestly, I have made over 450 public <laughs> speeches and presentations, and I still learn something from pretty much every speech. But I can promise you, if you take these two tools and you really work them, your next speech is going to make more impact on your audience than you thought it ever could. Now, before we finish up today, I would like to give you the opportunity to ask any questions. I'll do my best to answer them <coughs> if it's about public speaking or about music or what's on the back of my laptop, what that means. I will be glad to answer them. Any Question? So do you actually memorize your speech or do you do like you memorize portions and then variations of it? How? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I do not memorize it. I do write it out though. Mm -hmm. And what I find is as you rehearse it many, many times, it actually impresses itself upon you. The, I have this, I'm using this little clicker here and these little notes here, but honestly I haven't even looked at them. Okay, they're just kind of sort of an emotional security blanket. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Once you rehearse it, you'll be able to say them. And that's the thing about rehearsing it, is that when you really get to know it, you can say it in your own words. And that's why it can be natural. However, I would recommend the very first, actually the first 30 seconds, and the last 30 seconds, know exactly what you're gonna say, and actually memorize those. The last 30 are especially important, not only because it sticks in people's minds, but we all know how often it is that somebody says, um, I know you had a half an hour to speak, but you actually have 10 minutes now. <coughs> we know how that can get. So it's good to be able to go right into it. Great question. Do you record yourself? I do, I do actually. Um, Jill is recording me right now. I try to record every speech. I don't always get it done, but uh, it's, it's really important to be able to do that. I love uh, Darren LaCroix, a former world champion of public speaking. He says, everybody is jealous of me and my world champion of public speaking trophy. Well, they're not jealous of me and my closet full of videotapes, which I constantly made of myself and I constantly watched. So yeah, it's absolutely a great idea to, to record yourself and then actually look at it. <laughs> I'm amazed I can fool myself that actually recording it actually helps. Do you have any advice on trying to incorporate humor into your presentation or speech? Yes, that is a great question. 
probably, and I, I hope I don't insult anybody here, <laughs> probably the worst advice I've ever heard on public speaking, actually the worst advice I've ever heard on public speaking is imagine your audience is in their underwear. But the second worst <laughs> advice I've heard is to start with a joke. Because the problem is jokes, even if they're funny, they're, they take you away from where you were going. I use that little, that I call it a joke about the, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall practice. I didn't do it really for humor. I did it because we all know that and we all recognize it and it had a real point. What I would recommend as far as humor is concerned is to really, is to try to make it organic. Think about things that you're going to say and talk about and think about what are some of the, what are some of the ridiculous aspects of it. And a great way to do that is to use stories and to use dialogue in those stories. Like you'll, like when I, like today, for, I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was talking about what I used to do to start a speech, I could have just said, well, I decide, I would always start a speech by saying, good morning, I'm happy to be with you, and just move on. But by using dialogue and imagined response of somebody, I could really exaggerate it. You can't really exaggerate it when you said, you know, good morning, I'm happy to be with you. That would be just kind of goofy. But I could say, good morning, I'm happy to be with you. Well, we're not happy. So it was just a little, just a little response, not like a huge, not like a huge laugh. But, uh, but I think stories, and especially dialogue in those stories, are great. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question about re reusing content. Yes. So I give um, a fair amount of speeches okay. throughout the community, and I try to be really, really thoughtful about, you know, I mean, how many times can you talk about a hospital? Well, I try to be thoughtful if I'm in an education or if I'm at a policy maker, if I'm doing this. So I really do. I put a lot of pressure on myself to make each speech different because I keep thinking <coughs> in my head, God forbid there's somebody who saw me speak yesterday or the right. day before or a week ago. And a lot of my friends, authors, um, the people who you know I respect, they're like, Stacy, you can reuse your words. Like right. you can reuse words. But how often can you do that? Because I don't I try not to use reuse anything. I reuse themes and concepts, right. but you know, I don't think it's a problem actually. Um, I, I would agree with your friends. I would say I, I, I really like what you're saying about varying it. You can absolutely vary it for the audience. I mean, I gave this same presentation two days ago to a group of middle schoolers. Okay. Okay, and the content was basically the same. <laughs> it really was. It really was. Kind of the same. No, we're kidding. <laughs> You're all yeah. the same. Yes. But know your audience. <laughs> the content's the same. I mean, good speaking is good speaking, one way or the other. But absolutely, it was just tweaked a little bit. And and you can make it. One great way to do that is to make local references. If you know who's going to be there, you can say something about mention Leanne or Michelle or somebody that you know there, and the audience actually loves that because you're naming people in that group. Mm -hmm. So that's a, so you can absolutely reuse. And you know, for reusing, and I always have to think about when my kids were younger, we used to watch the Three Stooges all the time. Love Three Stooges, love Star Trek, love, love Jane Austen. Anyway, um, <laughs> I could go on for a long time. But the best thing about the Three Stooges is when something that you know was coming and so I don't think it's necessarily a problem. Okay. Yeah, anybody else? Oh, sorry. No, that's okay. Um, Guitar so, man. Yeah. Uh, do you have any advice about use of metaphors in speeches? Um, you know, it, right time to do that, wrong time to do that, inappropriate use of it. I think it's I think it's a good thing if it, as long as people are going to get it. You know. It, this can especially happen like when you're, if you're trying to come up with some, it can be really useful like if you're trying to come up with something to help people to remember what it is you're saying. Like today, I did two, hook them and book them, and rehearse for the reward. Well, I made those two up just for this presentation, but you have, kind of have to say, well, is it stretching it too much? You know, I think it's definitely a good thing. Um, metaphors can be really, really powerful. Absolutely. 
I, I don't have a lot of great, <laughs> sorry, I don't have a lot of great advice on that, but, uh, but, but I do think it's, it's definitely a good thing, especially if people it will get the reference and not have to kind of think about it. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I kind of see the connection. Okay. Thank you. Question. Yes? Other than practicing and rehearsing, do you recommend anything for <clears throat> confidence? Because I lack the confidence to publicly speak. That's a great question. <laughs> that is a great question. Picture yeah, I'm like, <laughs> 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 I always thought I was naked, but okay. <laughs> 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 it's not really nice. Well, I mean, one thing is certainly, one thing is certainly practice. Is not just rehearsing the speech itself, but practice in general, speaking in general. Two and a half years ago, I joined Toastmasters. And I joined Toastmasters for one reason and one reason alone. And that is to get more stage time. Okay, stage time is what really will do it for you. In fact, I've, I have a motto, and I tell people at my office this. I tell them, I will never, ever turn down stage time. In fact, uh, Dar Darren LaCroix, who I mentioned before, world champion of public speaking, his mentor told him something that is really struck me, and I told Darren I really love this. His mentor told him, if you ever, ever turn down stage time, I will never help you again. <laughs> wow. Now, I don't say that to, to the people that I mentor. Did I ever say that to you, Michelle? No. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't say that to people I mentor. But that really hit me that you really need the practice, you need to do it. The, I guess there's two other quick things. One is to recognize that you're gonna be nervous beforehand. I was sitting out in the car in the garage this morning, going over this presentation in my mind, because I always get nervous. Like I said, I've spoken almost 450 times, but I get nervous every single time. But when you finally get up on stage and you actually see people, it's much better. Uh, so, so uh, I think I had another one, but that, but that's really what it is. It's just to recognize, yeah, you're going to be nervous. Oh, I know what the third one was. Have you ever had a presenter couple come up on stage right here, maybe, and you thought, man, I hope they give a rotten speech? No, you want them to succeed, right? Unless you're in middle school, <laughs> unless you're in middle school, your audience wants you to succeed too. Just keep that in mind. That's so as much talking, as much public speaking as you've done. Do you do you do this differently for a work setting? Like if you're speaking to a group of um, senior leadership mm -hmm. people at work, as opposed to some of us? Not really. <laughs> Not really. I mean, you do have to adapt it for the audience, certainly, but that's mostly the references that you use. Really, the process of speaking is really very much the same. As I, as I said, I, went, I talked to a bunch of middle schoolers two days ago, and really, it was very, very much the same. And I found, honestly, what I used to do, and I think we're gonna need to finish up here, right? Um, so this will be the last question. <clears throat> but what I found is that instead of going into, like, what I call PowerPoint mode, you know, it's just I got the PowerPoint on the screen and just uh, <laughs> what I found is by using these same tools that I've learned in, in speaking, I've learned that it's made my speeches and presentations at work so much better. I gave this really highly technical briefing. I'm I'm a I'm a computer geek. That's what I do for my job. Oh, that's what the APIs. Yeah, that's what APIs are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I gave this briefing actually on new features in our API. <clears throat> but I started out with five minutes at the beginning of saying, now before I talk about these features, and I didn't do it at the very beginning. <laughs> before I talk about these features, why do we care about APIs? And I think everybody in the audience was going, because uh, it's our job. But why do we care about APIs? It's because our company is able to have our product to be connected by other products that make the experience for teachers and parents better. So that those teachers and parents can make sure that the students learn more and are more successful in school. 
And then I continued with 55 minutes of technical presentation. I tell you, that day, I had a better response from the audience than I had ever had before. People were actually asking questions. They were walking up to me afterward, wanting to know more. And I think it was all because I started out in a way that made people care about it. Thank you. <laughs> Want to be a part of Toastmasters? What can they do? Yes. Um, well, we we have a, a class coming up here. Uh, the class is full now. Sorry. However, the Loudon Toastmasters Club, we we're, we're still there, and we would love to have you come out and visit. We meet first and third Thursdays <laughs> of the month, including tonight. Um, but then in January, and this is pretty exciting. Uh, I'll be sending actually, Leanne. I'll send you a, a notice about okay. it. Okay. Um, but in January, on January the 19th, mm -hmm. we are having an open house. We meet at the Thomas Balch Library in the middle of Leesburg. Not the Russ Library, the Thomas Balch Library. And on January the 19th, we're having an open house where we have people in, and we kind of give you an idea of what the club is about. And we would love to have you come on out. Join us, or just come out and visit. Either way, we'd love to have you. That's awesome. Uh, we are going to take a few minutes while Mr. Hogan uh, sets up his presentation. Gary, if you don't mind, just uh, standing over here, maybe if, if you all have questions, you can come up to Gary Absolutely. or Jill. Mm -hmm. you, sure. Jill will be here as well. Absolutely. And you can certainly ask them questions as Mr. Hogan sets up. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. You're awesome. Thank you. Yeah.